Hello everyone and welcome back to JG History and in today's video we're going to be answering what seems to be a very simple question. Why is Charles III the king? Now there have been a centuries of kings and queens of England and they have culminated in Charles sitting on the throne and I wanted to work out why exactly that is. Now this video is somewhat similar to the one I did where I traced Charles's lineage and I looked at how he is related exactly to every single previous English monarch and today we're going to be looking exactly how he has got the throne and looking specifically at the story of the English monarchy over the past a thousand plus years. So let's get straight into it. So beginning with Charles, Charles became the king because he is the eldest child of the previous monarch, which was Queen Elizabeth II. He was her eldest son and thus he inherited the claim to the throne and after her death in 2022, he became the reigning monarch. Queen Elizabeth was the eldest child of her father, George VI. She had a younger sister, Margaret, but she was the eldest child, and thus upon the death of her father in 1952, she became Queen Elizabeth II. George VI was not actually the eldest child of his father. He did have an elder brother, who was Edward VIII, very briefly. Edward VIII reigned from early 1936 to late 1936, and abdicated in favour of marrying a commoner, Wallace Simpson, um, and he could not marry her whilst being head of the Church of England, because she was doubly divorced, uh, so he could not remain as the king of the nation and also Maria, so he abdicated and the throne passed to his younger brother who became George VI in 1936. So George VI became the king because his brother abdicated. Well, Edward became the king because his father was George V and he was the king and he was the eldest living son, so in he inherited the title. George V was also not the eldest child of his father. He did have an elder brother, Prince Albert Victor, but Albert Victor predeceased his father, and so instead of the throne passing to him, it instead skipped over him as he was deceased and went to his younger brother, George. So George was the king because his elder brother passed away and he was able to inherit the title. And George was also the king because his father was the king. His father was Edward VII, and he reigned from 1901 until 1910. Edward VII was the eldest son of Queen Victoria, and thus he inherited the title to rule. Queen Victoria was able to become the Queen because her father was Prince Edward the Duke of Kent. Now, Prince Edward the Duke of Kent was not a king. He was not in line for the throne, really. He was the third son of the monarch George III, and he had two elder brothers. Edward's eldest brother was George IV, who reigned from 1820 to 1830, who died without any legitimate children. The crown then passed to his younger brother William, who became William IV, who also died without any legitimate children. And thus, the crown then passed to Edward, but unfortunately, Edward was dead at the time of this transfer, and so it instead went to his daughter, Queen Victoria. So Victoria was the queen because her father was the third surviving son of George III, and the two elder brothers of Edward never had any legitimate issue, so it went to her. So William and George were able to become monarchs because their father was George III. He was the reigning monarch from 1760 until 1820. George III was able to become the king because his father was Prince Frederick. Prince Frederick was the eldest son of George II. Frederick unfortunately predeceased his father, so the claim to the crown simply passed through him and went instead to George. George II was the eldest son of George I, and so he was able to become the king. And this is where we get to a few messy bits. So George I is the reason why we have this notion today that the current royal family are German, because George I was German. He, nor his parents, nor even his grandparents, were the ruling monarchs. His great-grandfather, however, was a ruling monarch, and this is how he gets his claim to the throne, but things are rather messy with this. So instead of following straight through George, we're going to go to the previous monarch who he inherited the throne from, his second cousin, Anne. Anne reigned from 1702 until 1714 and had no children, so the crown could not pass downward. She became the queen because her elder sister and also first cousin, Mary and William, were co-king and queen. Mary and William reigned from 1689, Mary passed away in 1694, and William reigned until 1702. Mary was able to become the queen because her father was James II in England, or the 7th in Scotland, and he reigned from 1685 until 1688, until he was deposed for having a son. James II was a Catholic, and Catholics were not very popular in the country at the time, and when he had a son, he altered the line of succession, putting his son in first place over his Protestant daughters, and as he stated that his son would be raised Catholic, Parliament did not want the country to revert to Catholicism, so he was deposed, and instead his Protestant daughters installed. James was able to become the king because his elder brother was Charles II. Charles II reigned from 1660 till 1685, but died without any legitimate children. And here we also see Charles and James's sister, Mary the Princess of Orange, was the mother of William of Orange, thus tying him in to the line. Charles II was able to become the king because his father was Charles I. Charles I is a very notorious king with 
being pretty much the only one to lose his head, and also the crown. He was the individual who lost the monarchy of England for a period of 11 years in the Interregnum, where Oliver Cromwell ruled as the Lord Protector instead. So Charles was able to become the king because his father was James VI of Scotland or the First of England. And this is where we tie in George I's claim. Elizabeth Stuart married Frederick V, the Elector Palatine, and their daughter was Sophia of Hanover. Sophia of Hanover then had George I. So George I was a great grandson of James VI and I, and that is how he gets his claim to the throne. He was the closest living male Protestant relative of Anne at the time of her death, and that was approved by Parliament, and he became the next monarch after her. So James VI of Scotland, or the First of England, became the King of Scotland by his birthright, but he became the King of England because of the lack of succession in the Tudor dynasty. To understand how he got the throne of England as well, we'll have to look at the previous monarch before him. The previous monarch before James was Elizabeth I. Elizabeth I reigned from 1558 until 1603, and she had no children. She inherited the throne from her elder sister, Mary I, who reigned from 1553 until 1558. Mary I inherited the throne from her younger brother, Edward VI, who reigned from 1547 until 1553. And Edward inherited his claim to the throne from his father, who was Henry VIII, and he reigned from 1509 until 1547. Henry VIII was the elder surviving son of his father, Henry VII, and that is how he got his claim to the throne. He did have an elder brother, Arthur, who unfortunately passed away, and if you'd like to learn more about heirs who never made it to the throne, click the video in the top right right now. It's a very good video. So Henry's elder sister, Margaret Tudor, married into the Scottish royal family. She married James IV of Scotland, and they sired James V of Scotland. James V of Scotland married Mary of Guise, and they had Mary the Queen of Scots. Mary Queen of Scots married Henry Lord Darnley, and they had James VI, slash First of England, and that is how he gets his claim to the throne of England. Now, there were many people who also had a claim to the throne, some with potentially a stronger claim to the English throne, but Parliament and Elizabeth before her death decreed that James should be the successor, and that is how he became the king. Now, if we thought the last bit was messy, we're going to have a really bad day here, because this is a very, very messy time um, with now we're entering Wars of the Roses territory. If you don't know what the Wars of the Roses are, it's 30-something years of cousins all fighting one another on different cadet branches of royal houses, trying to get the throne for themselves, and it flip-flops between two main houses, the House of Lancaster and the House of York. So to understand this properly, for those who don't know, we are going to go back over a century to Edward III. So Edward III was the king from 1327 until 1377, and he had four sons that we care about. He had his eldest son, Edward the Black Prince, his second eldest son, Lionel of Antwerp, his third eldest surviving son, John of Gaunt, and his fourth eldest surviving son, Edmund of Langley. So these four brothers are incredibly important to understand the tumultuous time of the Wars of the Roses. Edward's eldest son was Edward the Black Prince. Edward the Black Prince should have inherited the throne after the death of his father, but unfortunately he predeceased his father by around a year, and he died in 1376. Now, Edward the Black Prince did have a living son prior to his death, so when Edward III died, the claim passed through Edward the Black Prince and went to his son Richard, who became Richard II. Richard II acquired the throne at the age of 10, and he reigned from 1377 until 1399. Now, this is where things begin to spiral. Richard was deposed by his cousin, Henry Bolingbroke. Henry was the eldest legitimate son of John of Gaunt, the third surviving son of Edward III. Henry deposed Richard and declared himself the king, becoming Henry IV. Whilst John's eldest brother, Edward the Black Prince, and his son Richard had now become extinguished, there were no more descendants of either of them, legitimate ones anyway. This meant that the next eldest brother was Lionel of Antwerp. Now, Lionel had passed away in 1368, and he did have a child before his death. He had a daughter, Philippa Plantagenet, the fifth Countess of Ulster. Now, Philippa was a female, and female rulers had not been established in England at this time. There had never been a queen who had ruled in her own right, but Philippa did have a son, Roger Mortimer. Now, Roger Mortimer had the senior claim to the throne in the male preference line. A male preference dictates that the elder son should acquire all rights of succession, but if there are no sons to pass the crown to, it can pass to daughters. Now, people who believed in male preference believed that Henry IV did not have the most senior claim to the throne, but in Henry IV's eyes, he did have the most senior claim in the male-only line. 
Henry the Fourth's father was John of Gaunt, and his father was Edward the Third. He was a male only descendant of Edward the Third, whereas Roger Mortimer had passed through a female, so he was not a male only descendant. So those who believed in the male preference logic would have preferred Roger Mortimer to be the king, and those who believed in the male line only logic believed that Henry the Fourth should have been the king. So to briefly recap, we have started to see the seeds of the Wars of the Roses begin planted. Henry IV has usurped the throne from his cousin Richard II and declared himself the senior male-only claimant to the Kingdom of England. He does have a cousin, Roger Mortimer, who does have a senior male preference claim to the Kingdom of England. And this is where we should also acknowledge the final house that plays a big role in this, the House of Beaufort. Now, John of Gaunt was a married man, and he had a legitimate son, his eldest son, Henry IV, but he also had children with his mistress, Catherine Swinford, who were later legitimised. The eldest of these children was John Beaufort, the first Earl of Somerset. John Beaufort was the eldest legitimate son of John of Gaunt by his mistress, Catherine Swinford, not his eldest legitimate son overall. Henry IV legitimised the Beauforts, but specifically barred them from ever inheriting the English throne. So anyone with Beaufort blood could not claim the English throne based upon this right. John of Gaunt was the Duke of Lancaster, and this is where the House of Lancaster comes from. Henry IV was the first ruling member of the House of Lancaster. Now we are going to understand how the House of York was created. So as previously stated, the second elder surviving son of Edward III, Lionel of Antwerp, had a daughter, Philippa Plantagenet. Philippa had a son, Roger Mortimer, and Roger Mortimer had a daughter, Anne Mortimer. Sir Anne Mortimer was the senior male preference claimant to the Kingdom of England, despite the fact that she was a woman. Now Anne Mortimer had a son, Richard Plantagenet, the third Duke of York. Her son's father, and the person who she married, was Richard of Conisper, the third Earl of Cambridge. Richard of Conisper was the son of Edmund of Langley, the fourth surviving son of Edward III. This meant that Anne Mortimer and Richard of Conisper's son, Richard Plantagenet, the third Duke of York, had inherited an arguably much stronger claim to the throne than the current reigning Lancastrian monarch. Richard Plantagenet was a male line descendant of Edward III. Now, his male line descent claim was not very good because he was descended from the fourth surviving son. That wasn't the senior male claim, but he was a male line descendant. He also was the senior male preference claimant with his descent from his mother, Anne Mortimer, and her being the great granddaughter of Lionel of Antwerp. So this is how the Wars of the Roses begin. This is why Richard Plantagenet and the Yorkists were claiming the throne for themselves, because they believed they had the senior claim. Now, moving back to the House of Lancaster, we see Henry IV has a son in Henry V. Henry V becomes the king, and he reigns until 1422, and he has a son, Henry VI. Henry VI is the monarch when the Wars of the Roses kick off, and he is the person who faces Richard Plantagenet and the Yorkists. Now, the Wars of the Roses begin with the First Battle of St. Albans in 1455, and this culminates in a 30-year-long civil war with the different factions vying for the crown. Richard, the third Duke of York, eventually is killed at the Battle of Wakefield in 1460, and thus the claim to the kingdom passes to his eldest son, Edward, Earl of March, who becomes Edward IV. Edward defeats Henry VI and becomes the king in 1461, and he reigns until 1470, before he is briefly deposed by Henry VI, but he retakes the throne in 1471, and at the Battle of Tewkesbury, ends up killing Henry's only legitimate son, Edward of Westminster, and kills Henry VI whilst he is imprisoned in the Tower. This meant that Edward IV had extinguished the male line of the House of Lancaster. Henry IV had no other legitimate male descendants or legitimate descendants at all. His only legitimate line rested in the royal line, which went from Henry V to Henry VI to Edward of Westminster. None of these people had any brothers or anything like that, so that was it. The House of Lancaster had been demolished. However, this is where the House of Beaufort comes in. John Beaufort's eldest son was Henry Beaufort, the second Earl of Somerset, but he passed away in France in the Hundred Years' War fighting and never had any children, so the next eldest surviving son of John Beaufort was his son, John Beaufort, who was the first Duke of Somerset. John Beaufort was the father of only one child, Margaret Beaufort, and Margaret Beaufort was the mother of Henry VII. 
This meant that Henry VII was the senior male Lancastrian claimant, but through a line specifically barred from ever inheriting the English throne, the Beaufort line. He was, however, the senior male claimant, so to Lancasters who despised the House of York, he was the best choice of monarch. Whilst this doesn't actually affect any royal descent from the throne, Henry was the son of Edmund Tudor, and Edmund Tudor was the son of Catherine of Valois. Catherine of Valois was also the mother of Henry VI. Henry VI and Edmund Tudor were half-brothers, so this did strengthen his Lancastrian claim to Lancastrians. Now, Henry VII remained in a long exile in Brittany under the protection of the Duke of Brittany, and Edward IV tried on a number of occasions to get him out and to, well, kill him. He was from a line specifically barred from inheriting the throne after all, so he wasn't exactly much of a threat. Edward IV's second reign was from 1471 until 1483, and this was a relative peaceful time over England. Now, Edward IV had a lot of children. His eldest child was Elizabeth of York, but she was a woman, and so his eldest surviving son was Edward V, and his younger brother was Richard of Shrewsbury. Edward IV passed away in 1483, and this meant that his elder surviving son, Edward V, became the king. Now, Edward V became the king at 12 years old, and Edward IV declared his protector to rule the country in his name, his brother Richard, the Duke of Gloucester. Now, no one knows exactly what happened, but Edward V and Richard of Shrewsbury were taken to the Tower of London, where they awaited Edward's coronation. However, in this time, it was discovered, in big quotation marks, that they were indeed illegitimate. Apparently, Edward IV had previously been pre-contracted to marry another woman before he married his wife, who had the children who would become royal children, Elizabeth Woodville. And at this time, marriage being pre-contracted to marry someone meant that, well, you basically married them. So this meant because Edward's children were illegitimate, the next senior male who would become the king was Richard, the Duke of Gloucester. Richard the Duke of Gloucester became Richard III, and we all know about Richard III, and at the Battle of Bosworth Field in 1485, Henry VII killed Richard III and claimed the crown for himself. So, that was a lot of information and a very convoluted timeline indeed, so we're going to do a very quick recap. Henry VII was able to claim the throne based on the right of conquest, that is what he decreed his right to rule over, but he was blood related to the monarchs in that his mother was Margaret Beaufort, her father was John Beaufort, the first Duke of Somerset, his father was John Beaufort, the first Earl of Somerset, and his father was John of Gaunt. The Beauforts were Henry's blood claim to the throne. Henry also had a stronger tie to the House of Lancaster because his father, Edmund Tudor, was the half-brother of Henry VI, with both of them being the sons of Catherine of Valois. The senior male descendants of Lionel of Antwerp, the second elder surviving son of Edward III, and Edmund of Langley, the fourth elder surviving son, culminated in one man, Richard Plantagenet, the third Duke of York, and he is why the House of York had such a strong claim and belief that they were the right monarchs to rule. So that was very complex and convoluted. I hope all of that made sense. I hope I explained it well enough. So to do a very quick summary, Henry VII became the king because he killed Richard III. Richard III became the king because he declared his nephew, Edward V, illegitimate and thus became the king. Edward V was the king because his father was Edward IV, and Edward IV was the king because he deposed Henry VI, as his ancestry, in his eyes, was superior to that of Henry VI, and he had a better claim to rule. Henry VI was the king because he was the eldest surviving son of his father, Henry V. Henry V was the king because his father was Henry IV, and he was the eldest surviving son. And Henry IV was the king because he deposed his cousin, Richard II, taking the crown for himself. So there we go. All of it is explained, all of it is done. Hopefully the Wars of the Roses make a lot of sense and now we can move into a much easier time. Now the progenitor of all of this chaos was Edward III as we know and Edward III was the eldest surviving son of Edward II so that is how he became the king. Edward II was the eldest surviving son of his father Edward I although he did have a lot of other sons before him. He had four sons who should have been the king before Edward II but they all passed away. Edward I was the eldest surviving son of his father, Henry III. Henry III was the eldest surviving legitimate son of his father, John I. And now we get into a bit more convoluted stuff. John was not destined for the Kingdom of England at all. He was not destined for pretty much anything, as he was the youngest child of his father, Henry II. 
John became the king in 1199 upon the death of his elder brother Richard I or Richard the Lionheart. Richard the Lionheart had reigned for 10 years and proclaimed John his successor and Richard was able to become the king because his father was Henry II and he was the eldest surviving son at the time of his father's death. The eldest brother of both of them was Henry the Young King, who ruled alongside his father as a core junior king, but he never ruled in his own right and thus is never counted as a real monarch of England. And he predeceased his father and never had any children of his own. Henry II became the king because his mother was Matilda, Lady of the English, and she was the daughter of Henry I. Henry I's only legitimate son was William Adeline, and William Adeline had passed away in the White Ship Disaster. Thus, the legitimate claim to the crown went instead to his daughter and passed through her to her son Henry. That is how Henry's blood claim to the throne was created, but he actually got the throne by defeating his cousin Stephen of Blois in civil war. Stephen was the king from 1135 till 1154, and he was a grandson of William the Conqueror through his daughter. Stephen had usurped the throne before Matilda could be declared the queen, and this created a 19 year long civil war, which was between Matilda and her cousin Stephen, and Matilda wanted her son Henry to be the king, and thus at the end of the civil war, Stephen declared Henry would rule after his death, and Henry was able to inherit the crown. Matilda's father was Henry I, and Henry I was a younger son of his father, William the Conqueror. Henry had an elder brother, William, who became the King of England, becoming William II, but he never had any children and died in a hunting accident, supposedly, in the New Forest in 1100. Thus, this passed the claim to Henry. So Henry became the king because of the death of his elder brother, who was the King of England, and the William became the king because his father was William the Conqueror, the person who conquered all of England and took it for himself. William did have an elder son. William's elder son, Robert, the Duke of Normandy, was given Normandy, the Duchy of Normandy, and his second elder son, William, given the Kingdom of England. Now, William's predecessor was Harold Godwinson, and Harold Godwinson was not related in any way, shape, or form to William the Conqueror. Well, they probably will have been at some point, but in terms of the evidence that we have, we have no relation for the two of them. Harold Godwinson was the previous monarch before William, and William acquired the right to rule by defeating Harold Godwinson at the Battle of Hastings. So I went back to William the Conqueror in this video, but I do want to go back through the Scottish line and also through the Anglo-Saxon line and also through the Welsh line and look at why those people were the kings of those regions. So for example, with James VI of Scotland, we know how he became the King of England, but we don't know how he became the King of Scotland exactly, obviously through descent, but we don't know the specifics. We haven't discussed it in this video. So I hope you did enjoy this video. Please make sure to leave it a like and subscribe to the channel if you did. Thank you so, so much for the recent support on the channel. It has been honestly fantastic we have hit 1400 subscribers and we are getting we had like 20k odd views on the last video that i did so thank you thank you every single person who has subscribed to the channel and is watching the videos genuinely genuinely thank you so much i never thought this channel would be anything like it is so thank you thank you anyway thank you so much for watching and i will see you guys in the next video goodbye